All right, we're back in our study of Revelation this morning. Uh, Revelation chapter 18. And we've been going through the last few weeks. We've been in, a, I always took a few weeks break there with the new year and Christmas. But we've been, uh, the few weeks before that, going through the destruction of Babylon. Chapter 17 was dealing with the judgment on ecclesiastical Babylon or mystery Babylon, the great harlot. Midway uh, through the tri- tribulation, we talked about when, when I see that mystery Babylon is destroyed. Chapter 18 is will be more in this morning dealing with the destruction of Babylon as the capital city of the Antichrist and the economic and political capital of the world. Hey, Hannah, would you mind hitting the lights on for me? Thank you. Uh, so beginning in just a quick recap, we already went through verses 1 through 4 of chapter 18. And beginning in verse 1, it said, Another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. So John is now interacting, listening to a different angel than the one he was first talking to or, or talking with there in chapter 17, which indicates for us a, a change in the text. And the angel, it says, is glorious. He's reminding us that God is righteous and good in his judgments. Amen? And we also see the word great here. It says the angel had great authority. So as a recap, in chapters 16 and 17, we read about a great earthquake, a great city, great Babylon, great hail. Uh, We saw lots of things. Great plagues, all these things coming to us, being described in a, in a sense of the apex of human history. So we have all these things culminating here at the very end of the tribulation and of, of human history as we currently know it in this fallen state. It's all about to culminate in chapter 19 in the return of Jesus Christ. And so it's getting and it's building and it's building. So everything is intensified. We see veins already of these things. We've talked about that in the previous weeks. The the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. But it reaches its culmination here uh, at the end of the tribulation, especially the back half, the three and a half years. I also want to remind you the two most mentioned cities in the Bible are Jerusalem and Babylon. And for a quick summary, Jerusalem is the eternal city. It's the city of the king. Babylon is the eternally desolate city. The one that is never inhabited again. At some point, it seems that Babylon will be rebuilt from its current uh, you know, sitting currently in ruins and will become again the economic capital of the world as it once was. One reference for that would be Zechariah 5, 5 through 11. Uh, and so it'll be comparable probably in some ways to what most people think of, of Wall Street today, but it will not last very long. In verse 2, it says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons. A prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. The first and main point we need to grab out of chapter 17 and 18 is Babylon falls. (laughs) It does not make it through. The kingdom of the Antichrist will be completely destroyed, never to rise again. It will not last one second beyond the time appointed by God. It is powerless to remain. Uh, I do see this as we're going through this chapter, as it's dealing with the destruction of Babylon. I do see uh, the warnings here dealing with literal Babylon, a city that will be rebuilt. I think this makes the most sense, looking from here, looking back in chapters in Isaiah and Jeremiah 50 and 51. Uh, But the emphasis is still on the failure and certain destruction of the kingdom of the Antichrist either way. 
Uh, so that's the way I see it. Different Bible scholars, everything, they can have disagreements on it. What is universally agreed upon, though, is the kingdom of the Antichrist and wherever this capital is set up will come to complete ruins. It will not remain. Babylon, it says in verse 2, has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. This is a right in line with the picture we have of Babylon from Genesis uh, all the way to the closing here of its destruction in Revelation. It is a dwelling place of demons and perhaps a place that they will be de- confined to, one of two places they will be confined to during the millennial reign of Christ. Verse 3 said, All the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. So the nations, the rulers, the merchants are all intertwined with the perversion, with the wrath and the luxuries from Babylon. Remember, this is taking place after the seal judgments, after the trumpet judgments, after the bull judgments. And somehow, in the midst of all that destruction, this city of the Antichrist thrives in the eyes of men. It is a a wonder when you think of it that way. And lastly, in verse 4, we were told to come out of her my people the call for god's people to come out of her before her final destruction and i I see this as a double meaning The, the first and the primary meaning again seeing it as a literal city is those who are alive in this time either believers or jews they're called to get out of the city because it's going to be destroyed Get out. Like Lot was called to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. A lot of pictures we can grab, a lot of meaning we can grab out of that. But Lot literally, physically needed to leave Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, there's going to be people at this time, and they're going to literally need to leave Babylon, or they will be destroyed with Babylon. And thank you, Lord. He is mighty to save. He sent an angel. He grabbed Lot's family by the hands and escorted them out of the city. Yeah, God is a wonderful Savior at pulling out the righteous before he pours out his judgment. Uh, but they are called to come out. The second part is the call for us not to be in the Babylonian system. Again, the reminder, the spirit of the Antichrist is already here, and he seeks to establish his perversions in holy places. He wants, he wants to destroy us as individuals. He wants to destroy us as a church, to, per, to pervert us. He doesn't mind if we stay at church, as long as we're not a church that's actually following Christ. And so he wants to bring that, that perversion in. He wants us to live for the passions and the desires and the lust of this life. And we must be on guard against his attacks. We are called to not love the world or the things of in the world or of the world. And Babylon most certainly represents the things of the world. So let's continue then into verse 5. It says, For her sins, being Babylon's, have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquity. Render to her just as she has rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously. In the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she'll be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. Whew. Back in verse 5, it says her sins have reached to heaven. You know, there's a brief time we can look on wickedness and we can see people in sin and we can think that they're flourishing. We can see the partying, the indulging in sin, the blasphemy, and it, and it can look for a moment like nothing bad's happening. Like there's no consequences for it. 
But we, rem- we must remember that judgment is certain. Judgment is coming. It says God has remembered her iniquities. In Genesis 11, when Babylon first came on the scene, they wanted to build a tower that reached to the heavens. And now that we get here to its destruction, it says her sins have reached to heaven. Unashamed indulgence in sin, no restraint, like Sodom and Gomorrah, like Belshazzar, when we looked at him in Daniel chapter 5, who was feasting and, dr- and drinking and praising false gods with the holy cups that came out of the temple in Jerusalem. No reverence for God at all. That's what we're seeing here. And it says here, God has remembered her iniquities. It reminds me of Psalm 73. I don't know if you're familiar with that psalm, but I love Psalm 73. It speaks of, uh, of an internal battle. Looking upon the wicked and being tempted. But then he remembers their judgment is sudden and inescapable and the blessings of God. And starting in Psalm 73 in verse 2 and 3 it says, As for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Sometimes we can look on those living for this world and it looks tempting to us to join in. It appeals to our sin nature. We can't see if all we look through with our physical eyes in the short term, we can't see what's so bad about it. And here this psalmist is writing, he says, I looked upon and I desired, I was envious of the boastful, the proud. Those who are arrogant enough to live life like they will not give an account to God. But verse 17, when he gets down to it, says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Life looked pretty good until he remembered what path they were on. It looked pretty tempting to join them until he remembered where that path was. Leads. And so in verse 22, he says, I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. A beast just being led by his temporary desires, by his immediate wants. But wisdom is found in the presence of God. In his presence, we find understanding, strength, and contentment. And it's so important for us that we enter into that fellowship with him daily that we do not become envious of the wicked or so easily led astray. We need to be in his word and on our knees in fellowship with him every day. Because these attacks, these lies are being pushed at us every day. And the devil knows where we're, temp- where we're, where we're uh, susceptible. And he'll throw out the lies. We must also... Take in the truth. And getting down to verse 26 here in the psalm, it says, My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. You know, our flesh does fail at times. I think every one of us can admit that. Our hearts are not always pure. I would love to say my heart never stumbles, but my heart stumbles all the time. In fact, we might say more accurately that we are rarely, if ever, pure, except by the blood of Christ. We fail in reality Often to think rightly or to act rightly. But the psalmist said, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So in our own strength, it's true. We can't stand against sin in our own strength. But praise be to God, we don't stand alone. We have an advocate. 
One who has died in our place and made us new. One who has made us clean. Thanks be to God that our hearts, though we are tempted, though we stumble in our flesh, God is the strength of my heart. Amen? And so I cannot stand on my righteousness, but I can stand on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And from that, we should long for His holiness. We should long to be more like our Savior. And we can even find rejoicing in our weakness because we find that we know we have victory because Christ has won. He has defeated sin for us. He has done what we could not. You know, I think the devil often wants us uh, to identify in our sins. Common things he will throw at us to identify in our weaknesses, in our failures. But we're not called to identify in the old man. We're not called to identify in the dead man as those who have been born again. We're called to identify in the new. I don't share a destiny anymore with the wicked. My portion is God forever. To be with him. That's incredible. It says again, for indeed those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. And this is what we see in Revelation 18, the destruction of the wicked. How important it is to be able to get a full picture, to be able to make wise decisions. And our problem is the devil, he likes us to see just to the end of the moment of the pleasure that we seek. No further. No thought of eternity. No thought of God. No thought of our purpose of what we're here for. No thought to the destruction of the wicked. Verse 28, he said again, It is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. We should not long to run with the wicked. We should not long to be joined with them. We are redeemed, as it said in Revelation, come out of her, my people. And it says here in Psalms, it is good for me to draw near to God. We have known the emptiness of sin, haven't we? We have known how it can leave us uh, in greater despair and hardship than it found us. But have you known the joy of the presence of God? Have you known anything as wonderful as being in his presence? We may stumble. Our hearts may fail. But Christ does not fail for us. Amen? And an important question for us this morning, for each of us to self-reflect on, is can you say with the psalmist, I have put my trust in the Lord God? Do you declare all his works? Can you sing the song, I once was lost, but now am found? Was blind, but now I see? Is that you this morning? Are you among the redeemed? And if so, we are given wise counsel. Do not desire the wicked, the the pathway that they're on. Do not set your mind or heart to desire their passing pleasures, but set our minds to know the Lord God, and to remember the judgment that is coming on the wicked. It says they come in pride, but as they come in pride, it's only to be brought down. Those who live in sin, they live like they have no constraint, but justice is coming. Psalm 14 tells us the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He lives as if he has no accountability, but the wise know that Jesus, that the Lord God Almighty sits on the throne. Babylon, even right before its destruction, we see here, is full of pride. Her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. The sins of the righteous, they're blotted out. They're gone. But those who belong to this evil system will share the same fate as the devil and his 
demons. Judgment is coming upon Babylon, and her judgment is well earned. And that's what he goes on to tell us. Verse 6, render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she has glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. God's judgment is always just. Render to her just as she rendered to you. Repay her double according to her works. The evil she's committed and the destruction of the righteous, the leading people into unrestrained sin, will be given back to her. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's important that we always remember that sin earns death. It's its rightful payment. In simple form, we can see this plainly even in the physical realm. Well, even now going into the, phys- uh, to the spiritual realm. We see this. If someone lies, they kill their word. Anything they say is no longer of value. Their word becomes dead to us. Someone who has an affair brings death to their home. Even in a corrupt society, we can agree with the law of retribution. Uh, in the news in the past several weeks, you've probably have all seen, right? There's this, this um, article about four college students who were brutally murdered. And it's been all over the news. Well, justice cries out. This man must be stopped. We agree there must be something done. He must be held accountable. It can't just go ignored. It'd be even fair to say in a lot of uh, what they're portraying, we see within the world, the world is portraying outrage about this. This is unacceptable. And rightfully so. It was gruesome and it was an evil act. But when God told Abram that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, if you recall, Abram said, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Oh, he was concerned. He was, Abram thought, God, there's got to be some righteous people there. You're not going to kill all the righteous with the wicked, are you? But indeed, God is always right in his judgment. As we learn, the only people there were Lot and his family. And God took them out, but not even ten could be found. And the God of all the earth will do right. Evil will be punished. So he does not just pour out vengeance alone. He repays the wicked with justice. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. Measure her sins and give it back full strength. What she has done, give her double. Exodus 22, in dealing with theft uh, and the payment, was to return double what you had taken. And so she has brought Babylon, this system, has brought death and destruction, and death and destruction will be given back. That is what she will inherit. In verse 7, in the measure that she has glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Babylon is materialistic and worldly. And again, be on guard not to love her. She glorified herself. This is contrast to God who we know who is humble. Sinners are proud, defiant. We are told to humble ourselves she lived luxuriously the definition from uh, the complete word study dictionary of this word luxury is such as men abandon themselves to when they have shaken off the reins of religion and reason 
They did not deny themselves anything that they wanted. They had an unchecked ability to pursue uh, pleasure. Zero accountability. They say, if if, if if it sounds good, if it feels good, indulge. Live entirely for the pleasure of the flesh. No thought of right and wrong. No thought of reason. They abandon it. No thought of religion. No constraint. And she says in her heart, I sit as queen and no widow and will not see sorrow. She is prideful and sees herself as unmovable. She tells herself hardship or judgment will never come to me. But what does verse 8 say? Therefore her plagues will come in one day. Death and mourning and famine. And she'll be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. Babylon will be judged quickly. As we look at the destruction of Babylon, I want to ask you the question, is this not the end, though, of all the wicked? Does not judgment or death come at an hour or on a day not expected? Does anyone get in a car today think it's saying, well, I think today I'm going to die? Do people... Uh, go swimming or get in a pool or, or a lake and think, today I'm going to drown? How many people think tonight when I go to sleep, I, I will not wake up to see another sunrise? So many people enter into death with this heart of pride. This idea that I will not see judgment. I will not see sorrow. But it says her plagues will come in one day. Death and mourning and famine, and she'll be utterly burned with fire. Judgment is coming. Sin is not tolerated forever. God is long-suffering. He is patient. But when destruction comes, when judgment comes, it will be too late. What is the direction for us? Humble yourselves. Turn to God. If you do not know Him, do not lie to yourself saying, after I live in sin for a season, I will turn to Christ. The sinner's end comes not when he expects it, but when God appoints it. Turn to him today then, while there is time. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. You know, when we look on this judgment, how beautiful it makes the cross. When we reflect on the road each of us were on. How wonderful citizenship is in heaven when you see the end of Babylon. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 through 6. It's a prophecy about the coming Messiah, about Jesus. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sometimes we can have this idea that in Christ is just a free pass, but God has not just given a free pass on our sins. He's a righteous and just God. He will always do what is right. He did not just give us a free pass. When God became a man, he paid for our sins by offering himself on the cross in our place. He became a sacrifice for our sins. Remember, the wages of sin is death. And Christ paid our debt for us. He died in our place. And the gift of God, therefore, then is everlasting life in Christ Jesus. And that's why he's the only way to heaven. That's why there is no other way. He is the only one who has paid for our sins. He is the only one who can. And we see within that plan of salvation that God is completely just. In his gift of salvation. Our sins are not ignored. They are not swept away. They are paid in full by Christ. 
And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. We see here God is strong in judgment, but he is also mighty in salvation. And we see this destruction in 18, but there's rejoicing going on in 19. The worldly system is brought to nothing. But those who turn to Christ, they will live forever. What part of God will you experience? Will you experience his salvation or his wrath? You have no other options. You will give an account. You will experience either his salvation or his wrath. We will know him one of those two ways. Continuing on in verse 9, it says, The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, For in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. For no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver. Precious stones and pearls. Fine linen and purple. Silk and scarlet. Every kind of citron wood. Every kind of object of ivory. Every kind of object of most precious wood. Bronze, iron and marble. And cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. And all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you. And you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance. For fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who traveled by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city. They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had the ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour, she is made desolate. Well, this, of course, again, is happening towards the end of the tribulation period. It is the most difficult time in human history. It's been seven years of judgment. The 144,000, though, God had sent out that were sealed were proclaiming the gospel. There was an angel in chapter 14 who proclaimed the gospel to all nations and all people and in every language. God has been sending out the gospel to these people. And now they're seeing the destruction of this principal city. They're seeing the smoke rising from Babylon. And they're weeping. But they're not weeping for their sins. They're not crying out to God. They're crying for the loss of the kingdom of Babylon. They love this sinful city. The kings who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her are mourning and weeping. The destruction is so devastating. The kings, the merchants, and the shipmasters, none of them even want to get close to the city. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over us as for no one buys their merchandise anymore. The shipmasters, all who travel by ship, and the sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, also stood at a distance and wept. But why are they weeping? Well, the kings, they can't commit fornication and live luxuriously with her anymore. The merchants, it says, because no one buys their merchandise anymore. The shipmasters in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. They cry and they mourn over the loss of these luxuries, these pleasures, these abundance that they have. The kings, the merchants, and the shipmasters, they all record the destruction here for us as being quick. In an hour is how it's translated for us. It means to be suddenly or in a short time 
that this city will be laid waste. And when the city itself is destroyed, it will happen rapidly. Again, the city of Babylon is this picture. It's an evil, oppressive city. But in the eyes of men, it represented wealth and power and luxury. Isn't it fascinating how different God looks at things than men? 28 items are categorized for us in this list to display the wealth of this city. You could buy anything there, including uh, people. Slavery or human trafficking, as we more commonly call it today, will be present right up to the end. But there's a few Proverbs I want to share with you that that are good for us and for our hearts to reflect on. Proverbs 27.20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 15 says, The leech has two daughters, give and give. The end of all these pursuits is vain. In the end, no one can keep it. Verse 19 again, they threw dust on their heads and cried out weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. Isn't it true, even in our time, that all who live for this life must watch it slip away? None can hold on to it. David Guzik, in his commentary, he said, Hell will be a place of unfulfilled desire. Even those who lived in the pleasure of the flesh and acquired great names or wealth, they're brought to nothing but torment. They can't keep any of it. Hugh Hefner was a famous guy. He was the envy of lots of young men, the founder of Playboy, always surrounded in pictures with beautiful young women. He's, of course, dead now. Can you imagine what it's like for him now? Would you trade places with him? Are you envious of the wicked? Is his path with its end in view desirable? What about Steve Jobs, another a billionaire, brilliant in so many ways in our in our time? A life a lot of people would be envious of. Would you trade places with him now? Do you want to be where he is? I hope he came to know the Lord. I know no such accounts for him. I hope he did come to know the Lord. Well, I don't want to trade places with him. doesn't matter if you have all the money in the world. doesn't matter what status you have. Sin extols a great price. It's important for us, even as the redeemed, to remember sin has a cost. It's a path that should be avoided to it with, with all of our earnestness. It is a war we should fight that we might bear fruit to God's kingdom, that we might live meaningful, fruitful Lies. It is not that we seek to be holy for our salvation. Our salvation is found in Christ. But I want to make investments in God's kingdom. I want to be drawing close to God. I don't want to live for this Babylonian system that's destroyed. We want to store up uh, treasure in heaven where it will remain for eternity. And an old saying I've always appreciated is, is, is this about sin. It says, sin takes you further than you want to go, keeps you longer than you want to stay, It costs you more than you want to pay. A book I've been reading with my boys describes sin, getting into sin as being foolish, like starting to run down a steep hill. It says, don't begin down that path, for seldom do people ever stop without a painful crash. It reminds me again of what the psalmist told us. My feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. He was envious of the wicked, remember? Until he remembered their end, the end of those uh, who are living in this sin, and he remembered the end of those who are in God. Do not desire the path that leads to death. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Walk in his strength. Be in his presence daily. We are weak, but our God 
is mighty to save. And verse 20 here in Revelation says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. On the earth there's this great mourning that will follow them into eternity. But in heaven there is rejoicing. The destruction of Babylon means the establishment of the messianic kingdom is just around the corner. And the martyrs that were mentioned in chapter 6, they have now been given justice. And continuing into verse 21, it says, Then a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down, and shall not be found any more. The sound of the harpist, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you any more. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of a bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints, and of all who were slain on the earth. We see a lot of parallels. I really encourage you guys to go read Jeremiah 50 and 51 later on the destruction of Babylon. But I'm going to read here uh, at the end of that passage of Jeremiah 51. Again, dealing with the judgment of Babylon. It says, Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that would come upon Babylon. All these words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, when you arrive in Babylon and see it, And read all these words. Then you shall say, O Lord, you have spoken against this place to cut it off, so that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be desolate forever. Now it shall be when you have finished reading this book that you shall tie a stone to it, throw it into the Euphrates. Then you shall say, Thus Babylon shall sink and not rise from the catastrophe that I will bring upon her. And they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. You know, these passages in Revelation and Jeremiah are incredibly similar. And the city is given a clear warning that it will be removed. And it will be removed entirely. It will be removed instantly. It will be removed quickly. The great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. It shall be desolate forever. No people will ever inhabit the city ever again. A few other verses out of Jeremiah 51. Verse 25 and 26 says, Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, speaking of Babylon, who destroys all the earth, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you down from the rocks, and make you a burnt mountain. They shall not take from you a stone for a corner nor a stone for a foundation, but you shall be desolate forever, says the Lord. Down in verse 37, Babylon shall become a heap, a dwelling place for jackals, an astonishment and a hissing without an inhabitant. Only a dwelling place of great serpents or demons. Its destruction will be complete and eternal. But in chapter 19 of Revelation, the salvation of God is revealed. And we will go from the destruction on the earth to the celebration in heaven. But then again, the key question comes to us is, which group will you be in? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It's not just knowing about God. It's coming to know God. And the the question is, have you asked him to be your Lord and Savior this morning? John chapter 6, verses 37 through 40 tell us, all, uh, Jesus speaking says, All the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last days. Have you looked to Jesus for your salvation? Have you placed your faith in what he has done? John 6, 47 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. And so the question still comes to us, do you believe? Do you really believe? Not acknowledge. It's not an academic question. It's a question of, do you trust in him for salvation? Have you placed your confidence in Christ, in the accomplished work that he has done? Do you believe he is mighty to save? All will stand before him. One group will have humbled itself and cried out for salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus. The other will enter arrogantly into their destruction at an hour they do not expect. If you haven't come to know Christ, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. The word tells us when we do that, that he will lift us up. If you have not truly placed your faith in Christ, well, these things are really coming. We will really stand before him. So don't wait any longer. Do not love your sin. Do not allow that to keep you from him. Do not hold on to this world. Run to the only one who can save you and do it while there's still time. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for your salvation. Lord, we thank you that you have made a way for us to be redeemed. Lord, I again pray, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning, Lord, if they don't know you, Father, if they have not placed their faith in you, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they know they need you as a Savior and that they would humble themselves that they would ask you, that they would cry out, Lord, save me. That they would confess you as their Lord. That they would believe in their hearts, Father, that you came, lived without sin, and died in their place. Lord, you walked out of the grave three days later, showing us you had power over sin, over death. And, Lord, that you took up your life, we know that you can also raise us up with you for eternity. And so, Lord, again, I pray, Lord, anyone here that has not come into that relationship, Father, I pray that your spirit would move in them and bring them to you right now. It is not magical words you have or a specific prayer. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. It is his promise to you. And if that's you, I encourage you right where you're sitting, pray that in your heart. Don't remain in the Babylonian system. Come live in the eternal kingdom. Come be among the redeemed. And Lord, also I thank you this morning, everyone here, Father, that does know you, that has placed their faith in you. Lord, help us to live like the redeemed. Lord, help us, Lord, not to set our eyes on the wicked and desire, Lord, but to be in fellowship with you daily. To see our, seek our pleasure, our fulfillment, our purpose is all in you. Not to look upon the paths that lead to death and destruction with any longing, but that we would run from those and run to you. That we would love you with all our heart and soul and mind. That we would delight in your salvation and that we would long to be like you. That we would long to be with you. And Lord, as we take communion this morning and rejoice in what you've done, Lord, I pray that these things would be fresh upon our hearts. Thank you for being mighty to save. Thank you that we are not still on the path of destruction. Thank you for making a way 
for us to spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen. From creation to the cross, there from the cross into eternity, your grace finds me. Yes, your